Hi, good evening to everyone. My name is Edward Akani, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar. Today, we are going to discuss the basic financial services that um, are available for people and then what they mean and the various benefits that come with them. So before we proceed, I would like to do a quick introduction of our panelists, and then we can go on. So um, we have today um, Emmanuel Aquada, the head of distribution for Hollard Life. There's Mabruk Mela, who is um, a senior investment executive with Dalex Finance. We also have um, Emmanuel Akato, who is also an investment analyst with Data Bank. And then we have Desmond Bredu, um, an investment um, panelist also with um, Stambik Investment Services. And then finally, we have Timothy, who is with Access Bank. So um, I think we'll take turns and then each of the panelists can tell us something brief about themselves before we start. So we can start with Emmanuel Aquada, the head of distribution for Hollard Life. Thank you very much, um, Edward. Um, your introductory comments perhaps have said a lot about me already. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this platform and to be a part of this um, discussion, an opportunity to learn um, and an opportunity to grow other people when it comes to financial services. Um, Hollard is where I work. And um, like you rightly said, I'm in charge of distribution and that involves the branch network and the partnerships of the, of the company. So that is what I would say briefly uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Akwala. So we will move to Mabruk Miller of um, Delex Finance. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Mabruk Miller, um, a senior executive at Delex Finance. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this program to share some knowledge, learn some stuff. And uh, I mean, I believe it will be a great journey along the line. So uh, as I do it said, I'm a Delex Finance. And I'm a senior executive at Delex Finance. So it will be a pleasure. Let's see how this goes like. All right, thank you, Mabrook. Um, now we'll listen to Timothy, Timothy Basal from Access Bank. Hi, um, I'm Timothy. As um, Edwards just roughly said, I work with Access Bank. I'm with the operations department at um, East Cantonment's branch. I'm to be part of this discussion. Um, I want to learn more myself, and I also want to share the little I have and I know so that everybody also learns from me as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Timothy. So we we'll now hear from Emmanuel Akato Abba of Data Bank. Hi, good evening, everyone. Yes, so my name is Emmanuel Akapu and I'm with Data Bank as a sales manager. And I'm actually here this evening to also learn from all of you and just to enjoy myself. So um, we are all glued to learning from one another. So let's see how it goes also. Okay, and then finally, we hear from Desmond Bredu um, of Stambik Investment Services. Hi everyone. So I'm Desmond Bredu, um, and I work with Stambik Investment Management Services. And uh, I love to talk to people about financial literacy, and I think it was a great opportunity to interact with many people. So um, we are here to also learn as well. So hopefully we get a very good show. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you all. So I'm quite excited myself, and I'm looking forward to the session today. Um, I am. Uh, a firm believer in financial literacy. And I believe that, I mean, understanding financial literacy and how it works goes a long way to contribute to um, informed financial decisions. And so I look forward to today's session. Um, we're gonna run the poll so that um, as the session goes on, you ask, um, we, you answer a few questions. The idea is to actually learn from the session and then um, make decisions also. So the poll sort of inform you and ask your opinions about a few things that We'll be talking about. So, without me wasting much time, we would um, start right ahead with the session. We'll start with a question um, for T. 
Timothy, I mean, for all of the panelists. So um, we first want to understand what each one of you thinks about financial services. So Timothy, what do you think financial services are? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I believe that financial services are more like the services that are provided for individuals and businesses by financial institutions. So, <clears throat> for example, we have so many financial institutions in the world. Examples are, let's say, the banks, we have investment houses, we have real estate brokers, we have insurance companies, and all those things. So all the services that they provide for individuals and businesses can be put under that bracket as financial services. Okay. Basically, that's, that's what I do financial services. Thank you, Timothy, for that um, overview of what financial services are. Um, I think we'd also like to hear what Mr. Emmanuel Aquada thinks of financial services. So from your perspective, what are financial services? Uh, okay, so uh, Timothy, I think broadly defined it, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite aligned with what he said in terms of it being, um, <laughs> I was going to say it's being financial services provided by uh, financial service companies, but that would just be repeating the same words over and over again. But like he rightly said, um, these are services which, more like economic services, um, which you can get from the financial services industry. So he made mention of some examples. The insurance companies are one of them, um, um, stock brokerage firms, investment houses, um, uh, banks as well. There are many of them that we can list, but these all businesses which are into the financial services sector, um, they are the people who provide us with what we call financial services. So that is what I would say um, uh, as my understanding of financial services. Um, for that overview as well. Um, Desmond, what do you think financial services are? Um, I think um, a lot has been said, and I completely agree with what has been said so far. So, it, example, if you wake up in the morning and you want to maybe buy something, you, you pay via online, you pay via mobile money, you are partaking in the financial services space. You go out, you want to insure a car, all financial services. So, I think basically everybody has defined what it is. And I think everybody, one way or the other, um, contributes to financial services. So again, like if I really think like you are not part, but yes, if you send more money, you are you are in there. If you even pay or buy credits online, everything is part of the financial services. You might just see one particular portion, but there's a lot of things going behind what you're able to do. So yes, on a daily basis, everybody goes to or partakes in the financial industry some way somehow. Yeah. Wow, that's very insightful there. Um, Mabruk, what do you think financial services are? What's your opinion about financial services? Um, okay, so basically, um, I believe my colleagues have said quite a lot. I mean, uh, they've described it in terms of uh, uh, practical you know, experience that we go through on a daily basis and uh, what we do and as such, uh, we all partake in the financial service. But I would, for definition purposes, I mean, just to you know, sum it all up, uh, I mean, I would see it as, you know, uh, the mediums or let's say the platforms uh, or procedures, uh, including the vehicles through which or by which financial goods, I mean, the goods are quite a lot, uh, are managed, uh, traded or transferred by financial, financial institutions for individuals and institutions. So that's how I would define the financial services. Okay, all right. I, I think that's also um, a very good one there. Um, so finally, Emmanuel um, Akako, since we have two Emmanuels on the session, um, Emmanuel Akako, can you help us with what you think financial services are? Okay, um, I think uh, my colleagues have actually said it all. And I would also say basically the services offered by um, financial markets. So normally economists, depend on and financial systems, okay? And they actually do so because of developmental purposes. So that actually tells you how important financial services are, okay? And you would actually need the services of a bank, a commercial bank, an investment bank, insurance house. So they can actually provide a variety of services in managing monies and investments related services for 
customers and institutions. So that is what I actually want to add to what my colleagues have actually said. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I think from the, the first set of questions, we've understood what financial services are. I mean, for me, I feel like um, what Desmond said is very true. I mean, every single day you actually sort of participate in a financial transaction or some kind of financial services. And it's important to understand what these financial services are and how to uh, manage them. I think um, the definitions and then um, opinions that have been given are quite insightful. So we would now move to the next set of questions. And um, we'll start with Timothy. So um, when we talk about financial services, one of the key things that comes into mind are the types of financial services. And we know banking as a financial service. So Timothy, being in the banking industry, how relevant is banking as a financial service? Hi, Timothy, I think your mic is uh, muted, so we are unable to hear you. But the question is, how relevant is banking as a financial service? Timothy, I'm muted. Okay. Okay. So while while we wait for Timothy, I think maybe we can skip and then come back to him. So can you hear me, please? Okay. All right. We can we can we can hear you now. So Timothy, the question is, how relevant is banking as a financial service? Okay. So um, banking um, as a financial service is very 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 relevant in this in this age um, and time. You know, the banking industry is so relevant to the extent that it is the highly regulated in that. Um, industry in the world when you when you read about it so for example when you look at um, the fact that in 2007 from 2007 to 2009 there was economic recession in the u.s when you go down researchers have said that when you go down deep into it you realize that it was caused by the fact that some banks were not performing their roles well you know the main role of every bank is to be an intermediary between lenders and borrowers where lenders are the people who bring money to the banks and then the borrowers are those who come for money from the banks so in that case where maybe a bank is not playing its role well as an intermediary it, it can cause the economy to crash so for example even in ghana when the government realized that some banks were not performing their roles well they had to take their licenses from them <clears throat> and people were saying that it, it wasn't good it was having its own challenges and all but the main purpose of taking all those licenses was the fact that when these banks collapse, the economy is going to crash. So for, for banks, they are more like the heart of the economy. Okay, so without banking, the economy is going to actually crash. If you have banks that are not performing well, it is more like the blood of the economy. So it's very, very relevant in our age. So there are so many things that we do as a bank. We provide safekeeping services. We provide means of payment. People get remittances from the banks. There are so many services we, we do or we provide for people. And then we even give the opportunity for people to invest into, in this um, very low risky investments like the T-bills and then the fixed deposits. The investment people will talk talk more about the investments, but we also provide a little of those investment opportunities for people who don't want to take too much risk. So in this economy, for example, during this COVID-19 period, you realize that, I don't know if you've read it, you realize that banks were given up. out loans more than and ever. And even the Bank of Ghana had to give more loans to banks to be able to give out or without the fact that people will get loans. To so that's what I think. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you so much, Timothy, for that um, insight. Timothy said that the, the bank is more like the, the heart of the economy. So that's something that is very um, insightful to know. And another thing that I actually picked up is for banks, I mean, if you want to invest, it's not sort of right to go to a bank to invest because what they offer is more of um, safekeeping and then very low returns. So when we get to investment, we'll hear more about some of the investment opportunities that you can take advantage of. Um, let's switch to Emmanuel Akato and um, find out from Emmanuel what advice he would give if someone comes to him today and asks for um, investment tips. So Timothy, I'm um, sorry, Emmanuel, what will you um, advise what would, what would be your advice to someone that wants to invest today? Okay, so um, after doing your due diligence, okay, about the firm you seek to um, invest in, I think you would need to do a number of things. Now, the first thing I think you, you can do is to make sure you don't get worried about how small the amount you have is. You are getting me. A number of times we worry about how much we would even want to start an investment with. And normally with investments, you don't actually need much to do it. Okay. So just a little and you being consistent is enough to start um, an investment. Okay. The same way um, if you are putting up a building, you normally do one, one block and then another, one brick and then an, another. So you don't, don't be too confused about how much you really need to start with. A 10 CDs, a 50 CDs, a 100, a 10,000, any amount at all can start. So don't let an amount or the amount stop you from actually starting an investment. Now, the second thing you need to do is actually to discipline yourself, okay? So make sure you've set priorities right, okay? They are, they are, I mean, most of the times we put monies down and before you know, you go back and you are taking it and using it for other things that are not really the reason why you place the money is there. So learn to discipline yourself as much as possible and don't get messy. Okay, don't mix up your investment needs. Have an emergency fund to take off your emergency needs. Have another one to take off your multi-purpose needs. Family needs will always come every now and then, and you need to set up an account for that. So don't mix everything in one basket to say that I have investment A, and in this same account, I'll pay my school fees from it. I'll marry from it. Anything at all, this is the account I'm going to use. Try to separate one account from the other so that you, you can actually watch how you're actually growing. And then the last thing I would want to add to that is for you to remain consistent. Okay, so if you decide to start, if you can decide to say on a monthly basis, you'd want to put X amount there. And if it's every month, make sure you follow through. If it's every two months you want to pay once, make sure you follow through. At the end of the day, you are now building the portfolio. So it's a gradual process. Don't be in a hurry to pass by any other person. Just be in your own race and then do it gradually. Yeah. So that, that, that I think can actually help anyone who wants to invest today. Okay, that's very um, insightful there. Um, I, I picked up a few things from what um, Emmanuel said. I, I think that it's important that you understand the different financial services and then when you, when you have an understanding of these things, you can now maybe dedicate a special account to each one of them. So you don't have to have one account that you say that you're going to um, invest from that account you marry from that account. You do almost everything from, from that account. So you should maybe get an account that you have for investment, an account for insurance, an account for marriage, and then maybe the normal um, housekeeping and things like that. So that's something that we can also um, learn from. So, I mean, when we put what Emmanuel has said into perspective, I would want um, Desmond to throw some light on the relationship between personal finance, advice, and then investment. So. Um, how does advice relate to investment? What, what, what would you say, Desmond? Um, so again, thanks. When you, when you talk about the, the whole personal finance, um, advice, your management um, things, right? For me, it has six pillars. And investment is one of those pillars that makes like managing your money or the personal finances stand tall. Now, I mean, I can just go through the pillars. The first one is to know your priorities, like know your goals, like Emmanuel mentioned. You also need to budget. You also need to, the number three thing is the savings and the investment. You need to also control your debt. You need to also plan for your retirement. 
And finally, you also need to, how do you call it, have some insurance and assurance policies in place. So basically those are, so for me, I would say that investment forms part of managing your personal finances. It, it's, you can't, and the thing is you can't do one in isolation. You need to do all of these things in tandem so that you know, okay, I'm looking at, at a holistic picture, not just investment. Because trust me, you can invest as much as you want. But if, you, if for example, you have insurance and you go out and some, uh, someone just hits your car, it means you have to dip into your investment to be able to, to pay off that insurance bit. So uh, investment forms part of managing finance, but they are broader things. And I think people should look at all of those things, like your goals, like your retirement, like your insurance, like your your your, your budgeting things. So that's the relationship that investment has with them or have with them, personal finance management. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's also very um, insightful there. Um, I'm very much looking forward to what uh, Mr. Emmanuel Akwada would say because many times people pay little attention to insurance and um, you ask people, what do you think about insurance? And they have little or nothing to say. Some of them don't even understand the need um, for insurance and i can see that there's a question there so we'll look at all of those things um so we would go to mabrook to um tell us what what um does one really need to invest i mean Emmanuel um give us a perspective about it so mabrook what would you say one really needs to invest uh i'm i'm, I'm not getting your, your question clear do you mean what does one need to know to invest or what does one need to invest, what, what one needs to invest is resources. So what do you mean, what does one need to know yeah, to invest, yeah. if I'm right? So what does one need to know to invest? Yeah, what does one need to know to invest? We had um, a perspective from Emmanuel Akato, so we'd want to hear what your perspective is as well. All right, so um, when it comes to uh, what you need to know to invest, I mean, I would say that uh, I would categorize into two broad areas. Um, first would be on the personal level, I think, Monakaku spoke about uh, certain things in there, but it's very, very important to start it in that order because if you don't, you would miss mm. a lot and you end up throwing your money uh, into areas where you don't really uh, have to. So first and foremost, on a personal level, uh, this could be either individual or an institution. You know, you'll be looking at stuff like, what are your goals? What are your financial goals? You need to have a clear cut, you know, uh, destination. What are you seeking to achieve? Are you looking at uh, capital gain? Are you looking at uh, earning some income? I mean, are you trying to save towards retirement or probably to acquire some property? You have to be very specific uh, and clear with those goals. I mean, I liken it to probably going to, uh, let's say, a bus station, say 37 or Circle Station, and I mean, you don't know where you're going to. And then, I mean, you just bought any Trotsky. I mean, obviously, uh, that's going to take you um, anywhere. And I mean, it wouldn't make sense. So the first to do is to set financial goals. When you're done with setting financial goals, you want to understand your risk tolerance. When you look at, when you say risk tolerance, I mean, you're trying to understand your willingness or your ability to take up uh, some amount of risk or lose your funds or probably a part of it in return for higher returns. Uh, it's, it's important to know this because uh, most investors uh, would, would say, uh, um, risks are raised. I mean, they don't want to take so much risk. Uh, all the same, there are certain people who are willing to take risks. I mean, when you got young people, I mean, young people don't mind uh, taking so much risk because they have the time to afford uh, to bounce back if they should go wrong. I mean, then you also consider your time horizon. Uh, when you say time horizon, you're looking at the period you need to invest to meet your financial goals. I mean, it's, it's going to take you a day, month, years, or decades to meet these financial goals which you've set you know, uh, before you. And the, the, the last thing you also want to consider is your financial position, your current financial position. I mean, what are your finances like? I mean, what do you have? What don't you have? I mean, are you earning uh, a good income? Are you earning salary or not? I mean, for instance, let's take a, a pensioner who is not earning uh, any salary now. Uh, this person wouldn't want to risk so much of his or her funds. So this pensioner is more or would more conservative than a young or an employed person who has, you know, um, a lot of um, monthly income. So, I mean, it's important to look at these four steps uh, of four factors on a personal level, which will guide and direct you to your choice of, you know, investment or investment risk. So, first and foremost, now that we're done with the uh, personal level, we then move to the investment options. 
So, I mean, one would ask, what are the investment options available? Actually, there are a whole lot of investment options. There are new ones coming up day in, day out. But the common ones that we all know we invest in in Ghana here, it would be the treasury bill, we look at fixed deposits, uh, we consider uh, bonds, uh, stocks, and then maybe a mutual fund. Uh, so having an in-depth understanding of yourself, you come and look at the investment, you try to understand these various investment options. You try to understand certain characteristics they possess, and then the risk or threats they may come with if you want to go into one. So uh, just to you know, uh, quickly explain uh, these investments so that uh, our listeners can have a fair understanding of them and maybe the risks that uh, they possess. We'll look at maybe the, the, the treasury bill. So the treasury bill are short-term debt uh, instruments which are issued by the government. Uh, it's a form of a, a loan the government is taking from the public and then they have a maturity um, below one year. So you can have uh, six, six months, three months or 364 days treasury bill. And treasury bills are actually classified as, uh, as risk-free investments. These investments, we say, have no risk. That's to say that uh, the probability of you losing your principal is actually zero. You know, so that's one character that a treasury bill has. Uh, and in fact, uh, the risk it comes with. I mean, you look at stuff like inflation risk. Uh, that's to say that when your treasury bill is due, what would the inflation rate be at the time? It's going to wipe out a part of your uh, interest if earned. So when you're going to invest in treasury bill, you consider stuff like the inflation rate, you consider maybe your expected rate of return, and you compare that to the treasury bill rate and look for the real rate of return to know if you're going to make some good returns or not. Uh, let's also look at the fixed deposits. I mean, uh, a number of us, you know, um, Invest in fixed deposits. I personally uh, do fixed deposits a lot. Uh, so when you are going to do fixed deposits, uh, someone want, would want to know what a fixed deposit is. A fixed deposit is also a short-term debt instrument, um, which is issued by financial institutions. Uh, it says that they have a specific uh, period uh, for an amount of money at a specific rate. Uh, mostly, they peg this rate to the treasury bill rate and. Uh, they are looking at a spread, uh, more than a treasury bill rate, represents some level of risk in there. So when it comes to the treasury bill, I mean, you want to consider certain things before you purchase a treasury bill. I mean, we are all aware of uh, the financial uh, uh, sector cleanup, what happens, people losing their funds here and there. I mean, so there are certain things that you may want to look out for before you purchase, uh, a, I mean, a fixed deposit, sorry, I'm very purchase a fixed deposit. I mean, you, you, you want to consider the legality of this institution. Is this company uh, legal? Is this company registered? I mean, we all hear about men's gold. Is this company licensed to carry out uh, this activity or this uh, investment? You know, and also, sorry. Okay, I think I got to know that the time is moving. All right, sorry about that. I mean, so let me just run through that. So you, have, you look at the legality of the institution, you consider the raise that this institution is offering uh, to know if it's if it's feasible or not, you consider stuff like um, the, the, the 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 their liquidity and solvency. Okay, because of time, I may have to run through the other investment. But basically, what I'm trying to say is that there are two things you need to do. You need to assess yourself on a personal level to know certain things about yourself. Then from that, you consider the investment. You need to understand the investment, its characteristics, the risks it comes with, and then certain things you look out for or pitfalls when you are going into them. So um, as I said, in our jurisdiction, I mean, we're looking at treasury bill, fixed deposit, bonds, um, stocks, and the mutual funds. Because of time, I'd have to uh, pause here and then maybe I'll continue later on. I got an excuse from Edward that I think time is, we don't have so much time. Yeah, um, so that's very insightful there, um, Abruk. I, I think I agree with you. I mean, when you look at investments, the, the key questions you ask yourself or the things you should know uh, number one, your goals, um, I mean, why you want to invest, your uh, risk tolerance level, and then also it's important to understand the company you want to invest with because you don't want to put your money somewhere and then in a week's time or in a month's time, you hear that the company has um, collapsed. And even uh, if the company is solid enough to actually um, invest your money well. So that's, that's great there. Um, I think we would now go and 
um, pick up some insight from Mr. Emmanuel Akwada, who's going to talk about insurance. A lot of people don't pay attention to insurance. And for me, it's um, something that I've come to believe in and then have confidence in because I have had um, a number of friends tell me that they had a close relative, either like a parent, I mean, either like a mother or a father passed. And because of the insurance that they had taken, the burden was lessened. And I found that I found that very comforting because I mean money won't replace the person, but it can it can do a lot of things. So Mr. Aquada will share with us um, what insurance really is, because people don't understand what insurance is. So um, we want to know what insurance really is, and then um, why should people take it more seriously? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Edward. Uh, really. Insurance is, is simply a risk transfer mechanism that one can use to, to take care of the risk that um, surrounds him or her. Um, and I'm glad that uh, my colleagues in, in speaking, I think Desmond was the one who mentioned about the investment mix that one needs to consider. And he did, he did mention that of insurance as well. You see, life is such that from the day you are born, uh, to the day you depart this life, you are you are faced with different types of risk. Um, the truth is that if we all knew what is in tomorrow, we could say that uh, we could put adequate plans in place to be able to take care of the unforeseen events that are in the future. But once we cannot predict what tomorrow will bring, then you must look for ways and means of taking care of um, the undesirable effects of tomorrow or the undesirable happenings of tomorrow. Why am I saying so? Um, once I was speaking to, but, but after I attended a seminar and then one of the presenters at that seminar, uh, I mean, a very knowledgeable person at that, she made mention of something. She was also talking about the way she plans towards her future and the type of savings that she does and all that. Then she mentioned something about she putting aside some amount of money on a monthly basis uh, for the sake of her mom. And then I was curious to know why her mom, but her reason was simple. I'm putting this money aside. Uh, that in case when my mother passes, then I can use, I can fall on this money to take care of the burial cost of my mother. However, if it so happens that I go ahead of my mother, then my mother would fall on this money to take care of herself. And to her, she might, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that she would have sat back and said to herself, look, I have a very brilliant plan in place. To some extent, yes, it is. But um, if you look at it quite carefully and you analyze it quite well, you will realize that uh, it may seem like a good plan, but it's not entirely so. Why am I saying so? If you decide to set aside some savings amount of, uh, let's say, 500 Ghana cities every month. And then you said you are going to be putting aside 500 Ghana cities every month because you have a mother who is living. And then someday that mother will depart this life and then you will fall on that money to take care of burial costs. Um, <laughs> uh, let's say you have planned that you will need about 30,000 to be able to take care of a mother's funeral or 20,000 take off a month. Let's, let's be modest. Let's even say 10,000. Even if you say that you are trying to raise 10,000 cities towards a mother's funeral, and so you are going to be putting aside 500 Ghana cities every month towards that. That would mean 20 months ahead of time before you can chalk that uh, 10,000 Ghana cities. What you don't know is when your mother will decide to say goodbye. That you don't have control of. So though you have very good plans towards that future, you don't have control of it. And it could happen that uh, this event you are foreseen can happen in the next one year. It could as well happen in the next five years. But what, what, what risk is, is that it doesn't prompt you. It doesn't give you a notice. It doesn't tell you when it's going to happen. So you don't have control of it. And that is where insurance comes in. So what insurance basically does is that uh, it just says that look at your life, look at all the things around you, which can cause you discomfort, the things that can take you into a financial mess, the things that if they occur around you, they will cause you to be financially worse off. 
those are the things insurance is seeking to take care of. So uh, I am a breadwinner of a home and I have a family, I'm a man, I have a spouse, I have children, but I also have parents living. Now it is my income that this family depends on for their daily upkeep. But there could come a day when my mom could decide to say goodbye. If she says goodbye, the same kitty that I draw funds from to take care of my immediate family is the same kitty I may have to draw funds from to take care of my mother. The question is, do I have enough to be able to take off those two events? I'm a young man. I've managed to secure a bank loan after working for the first three years to be able to acquire some Toyota Corolla. And then I leave this Toyota Corolla uninsured. I have left it third party because uh, all I care about is that I have to be able to go past the next police checkpoint. So I went for just third party insurance. But something happened and I lost this Toyota Corolla through an accident. The question is, where do I get money to buy another Toyota Corolla? The painful thing is really where it is a bank loan and the bank loan is still being serviced, yet the property is gone. So what we are saying is that there are risks around us in life as we go in and come out. There are constant risks that we are faced with. Some are to us directly in terms of our life. Some risks are to the people who depend on us, such as parents, such as spouses, such as children. All these people also carry risk. And then when it occurs to them, we have to bear the cost. If it occurs to us and we haven't made adequate provisions for people who depend on us to be able to continue life, their life uh, gets into tatters. So that is what the challenge is. Uh, then again, the average young man who wants to build a house in, in, a, in a country like Ghana, think about it. How many years does it take you to be able to put together that two bedroom property or that three bedroom house? You realize that it's quite a long journey to go through before you are able to raise a house. So why on earth would you go through that trouble of putting together a house or putting up a house and then just leaving it to all forms of risk so that one day through the carelessness of somebody, uh, just by leaving an iron uh, unplugged, you come back home and the house is set ablaze. And all the years you took to be able to put together that house is gone to waste and you have to raise money all over again. But all I'm trying to say is that there are various dimensions of our lives where risks confront us as individuals. And the, one of the smartest ways to be able to use to take care of that risk is through the use of an insurance uh, vehicle. So when it comes to insurance, Basically, this is what it says it's going to do. Let me bring it down to the simplest things. Insurance is more like an advanced form of susu. So um, for those of us who perhaps belong to some associations or some societies, um, uh, and then you, that particular society, there's some monthly dues that you pay. And then the society has some rules that guide its operations and say that because you are part of us, when you lose a parent, because you are part of this group, our obligation is to come to the funeral, give you 10 crates of minerals, add a donation of 1,000 Ghana cities, maybe add five boxes of water. That is our contribution to the funeral. And the only way you benefit from this package is that you pay your monthly dues of 10 Ghana cities. So if you, if you find yourself in an association of that sort, they say pay a monthly dues of 10 Ghana cities. And then when you lose a parent, you will come and contribute to water contribute mineral and give you a donation, your, 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 your security or your, your password to that kind of a package is the 10 CDs you are contributing. And that is all insurance does. That 10 CDs, if you are a group of 100 people in that association, each month that each person contributes 10 CDs, we have, 10, we have um, um, 1,000 Ghana CDs. So if we travel five months down the line, we have about 5,000 Ghana CDs. Every member of that group will not lose a mother or a father at the same time. It will happen to one person at a time. But what we are saying is that when it happens to one person and the package that we have announced will cost 2,000 because we have created this pool over a five month period and we have 5,000, we can pick 2,000 from the pool and use it to support the person who has been affected. We still continue to pay our monthly dues and then the pool keeps growing. It affects another person, we go back to the pool and pay from the pool and go and support the person. So that is the whole mechanism of insurance. We are 
one big pool. So if I go and insure my vehicle, for example, I have just joined a pool of contributors who own cars, who are saying that because we drive, we are prone to accident. We just don't know who the accident will occur to. But any of us could be involved in an accident. But when it happens to any of us, the burden should not be on our heads alone. All the rest of us in the pool will put our money together and help the individual who has been affected. If I decide to insure my house, I have just joined a pool of people who own houses who are saying that we agree that our house will be damaged through flood, through fire. So when it happens, we should be able to support that individual who has been affected. That is all there is to a mechanism of insurance. So if I go and buy a funeral insurance product and I said I've insured my father, I have joined a community of other people who also say that me too, my father is alive. Me too, my mother is alive. Someday they will go away. When they do go, I will have the responsibility of having to bury them or to lay them to rest. I may not have that bulk of money to do so. So I'm joining this pool of contributors. When it happens, it's like everybody coming together to support me to be able to lay my dad to rest. So it's like some, some form of an advance in sour, if you allow me to use that word. <laughs> but this time you are contributing on a periodic basis in order to be able to secure the future, which is very much unknown to you. So anytime the event happens, you are ready. You have already secured it through that pool that you have joined. So um, simply put, I'll say this is what insurance is all about. But you can see it in various spheres of life to the extent that the, the musician abroad, that, that top musician who said that she's going to insure her voice, has joined another pool of people who say that her voice cause can be damaged. The tennis player who says, I'm going to insure my ankle, has joined another pool of people who said that my ankle is what gives me incomes. If it gets damaged, I cannot play tennis to earn income. So I'm going to insure it. So basically, put, it's just a series of pools which have been created to support people in case they're unexpected happens. Thank you so much, um, Emmanuel Akala, for that breakdown. I, I find it very insightful and um, very easy to understand. So I believe that all the listeners um, are getting some great insights from that. Um, before we move to the next round of questions, um, I just want to remind our listeners that there's a poll going on. So um, a few questions out there. You ask, uh, you answer these questions, and then we can gather some insights and share with you after the session. We also have a WhatsApp community group. The link has been shared on the chat, so you can also join in and get updates on future webinars that we organize, as well as insights that will be shared on this webinar. Now we'll go back to Timothy. Um, Timothy, the question for you is, how does one maximize um, his or her banking experience? Um, how do you sit back and say that, okay, I am proud of being a client to um, Stambic Bank. I'm proud of the services that um, EcoBank is offering me. I'm happy to call myself um, a Fidelity Bank um, customer. I mean, for me, this is not an ad, but I mean, for me, one of the things I've, I've, I've enjoyed in recent times is banking with Stambic because when I go to the bank, it's very easy. I mean, there's no long queue. I move in and out and the process is very seamless. I also um, like going to Fidelity because the customer service that they afford is, is very top notch. So, um, Timothy, what what do you think, or how do you think one can maximize his or her banking experience? I think Timothy is having a few challenges, so um, we'll move to the next um, speaker. So Emmanuel um, Akato, um, can you help us with um, some, some advice on financial um, investment? So how can someone ad assess financial um, advice to make decisions? Do you have to go to the investment firm? Do you have to sit home and then make a call? Or do you have to just speak to a friend. So what would you say is like the channel or how can one actually assess financial um, advice and an investment? Many times people come to me and then ask questions um, like they want to invest, they have some money and they don't know what to invest in. So how, how do people get this kind of advice? Yeah. 
Okay, um, thank you for your question. I, I think in this um, digital age, it's very easy to come by information if you need it. Uh, it's just one I would want to recommend. You, I would recommend that you speak to a licensed financial advisor. So most, most of these people, you find them in financial institutions. So actually find one that is regulated by either Bank of Ghana or the Securities and Exchange Commission. You are getting me. Based on the type of financial advice you need. Okay. Now, for you to know how they are regulated, you can actually check the regulators' websites. And I think they display a number of institutions that are in good standings so that you get to know which firm you'd want to visit. Now, when you decide to visit that firm, try as much as possible to mention your needs to the financial advisor there. Okay, tell them what your objectives are. Uh, let them have a proper plan of what you have in mind so that they can actually advise you on what is available. Because there are different investment portfolios that sit in any financial house or firm. So the moment you tell them what you're actually looking out for, they are, it's very easy for them to profile you based on how much of risk you can take. And then they tell you which one they think can best suit the kind of need you have. So make sure you are actually disclosing whatever they need to know so they can actually help you plan towards your financial needs. So basically, that, that should be it. So make sure you are speaking to a licensed financial advisor. That is the most important thing so that you don't end up in the wrong hands of people who just speculate anything at all. Normally, licensed um, financial advisors actually have an eye on the market. So they can basically tell you what to look out for and what not to look out for. And I think with that, I mean, your chances are very good in making the right investment decision. So that should be it, that should be it, yeah. Um, thank you so much, Emmanuel, for that um, insight. Hello, Ed, hello? Yeah, hello, Timothy. So we have Timothy back. So um, we can hear from you, Timothy. Okay, sorry about that. I was having challenges on muting. Okay, so, but I have a fight to pick with you, Ed. You didn't mention Access Bank. <laughs> okay, okay. So basically what you were saying is um, the fact that how can we take advantage of banking nowadays? You know, nowadays I, I find it baffling when I realize that people still walk to the bank to perform certain transactions. Somebody will just walk to the bank to redraw 50 CDs, 100 CDs. You know, now we are going digital. Everything is online. You can actually send money from the comfort of your home in bed and all those things. We even have some depo ATMs that take deposits. You don't even need to walk to the bank to, come, to go and do all those things. I think that is one of the reasons why when you walk into banking halls nowadays, you don't see long queues unless maybe there's maybe a technical fault or something. But I think that is one thing that we should, we should learn. It's like people are scared to go to the bank to ask questions. I believe that people should be able to have that courage to go to the bank, speak to a customer care officer, speak to a relationship officer. There are so many things that you can benefit from a bank. You know, there are a lot of even soft loans that people can get from the banks. As I said earlier on, it is the, the, main, um, the main function of a bank is to, is to give that credit to people. Okay, so people can just walk into the bank, get loans. For example, if you come to Access Bank, it's not, I'm not hyping the bank, but it's just an example. You can just come into Access Bank. If your salary passes through the bank, we have a short code, star 901 hash, star 1 hash. As soon as you enter it, you get a certain form of loan because you, we call it payday loan. So let's say you, are, you have some emergency that you need to attend to. Maybe in a month, you are hard up with cash. Okay, you can just dial this short code and the cash just comes into your account straight away. You just walk to the ATM, you withdraw. You know, you don't need to, you don't need to struggle with all these things. Fine, some people are not technologically inclined and all, but I believe that most of us are now getting used to these digital systems where you can just be in your bed and send money and all those things. Another thing that we can benefit from banking is the fact that, you know, we do a lot of currency exchanges, CD to dollar, dollar to pound and all those things. There are some people who take advantage of these things, study the markets and able to know that maybe in, in X number of years or in X number of months, I'll be able to make more money when I buy dollar or when I buy 
euro or when I buy pound, I believe that when you walk into the bank, okay, you can just learn all these things from your from the customer service relationship officers, which will free, feel free to go to the bank at any time, okay, to be able to learn more. I think my time is up, so I'll, I'll cut it short so that the next person can also talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Timothy. Um, for me, I think that uh, technology has actually helped us to have a better experience of the, of the banking um, industry or the banking service. And I am quite impressed by the, the banks that have the um, cash accepting ATMs. I think it, it does a lot by way of reducing the queues that are in the banks. And the um, concept of um, internet banking is also a good thing. You can be in your house from the comfort of your room and then send money, receive money and do a lot of transactions. So I think what we should learn as listeners or what we should learn as uh, people is to take advantage of the, 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 the internet banking or the digital platforms that the banks afford us because it helps us to actually uh, maximize the experience that we get from these banks. So we'll move to um, Desmond. Um, Desmond, the question is, um, if you have to advise me today or if you have to advise anyone today, what would you say is the best time to invest? What would you say is the best time to invest and um, there's a follow-up question, just a second. What would you say is the best time to invest? What would you advise a person to invest in? And why would you advise a person to invest in that? So the best time to invest, what do you invest in? And why do you say that? I think so again, um, what's the best time to invest? I think the best time was 20 years ago, but maybe in, in current times, the, the very first time you end your first CD, you should think about investing. Here's why. Time value of money plays a critical role in how much money you make. Now, let me just give this example. So I did some math and I realized that let's assume a 15% compounded interest and um, let's say a fixed fix, fix 15%. Now, if two friends decide that, okay, we want to put 100 cities each month for the next 10 years, but friend one decides, that, okay, from day one, he or she will put the, the 100 cities. And she, I mean, every month she does it or he does it. In, in the, that 10 years, he or she would have contributed, let's say 12,000 CDs. That's 100 CDs a month for, let's say um, um, 12 months, that's 1,002 times 10 years, 12,000 CDs. If friend two also decides to wait till year, um, to year five, and instead of 300 CDs, he or she decides to do 200 CDs for five years, it also be also amount to the same 12,000 CDs invested. But here's the catch. Friend one would, at the end of the period, would have had 27,000 CDs as the total um, um, investment plus return. But friend two, on the other hand, would have had only 17,000 CDs, a difference of about 10,000 CDs. So th this is just to say that if you start early, you, you get the power of compounding interest, then you can get ahead of the curve. Let me put it that, that way. So, I mean, just answer your question, the best time is to start now. I mean, actually, it was supposed to 20 years ago, but if you miss that opportunity, take opportunity of today and start thinking about investment. And I think we should also encourage our children when we um, start giving birth, uh, start, we should encourage our children to start also investing. The very first time they start making some small, small coins, let them start thinking about saving, then investing. Now, in terms of what you should invest in, now, I think I like uh, uh, Miller's point when he mentioned about, let's it, there are two things basically that should define what you should invest in, but I'll come, I'll come to my case. Um, again, like he said, your objectives and your risk tolerance level. That is that. But if I'm to look at current situations, I would advise that maybe for, for, for us young people, maybe we don't have so much money and we want to take advantage of good return. So I would recommend that you look at the units, trust, and mutual funds. Here's why. So for those ones, you get to enjoy a compounded interest, not a simple interest calculation. And also you get also a professional to manage it for you. And with, with as little as 100 CDs, you'll be enjoying returns that someone would also with a million Ghana CDs will be enjoying. Because if you're both in the same fund, you're enjoying the same percentage return. So I think for us young people with small funds, we can look at the unit trust and mutual fund. And a good, good point here to also note that there are like five different types in Ghana. So depending on your goals and objectives, you can either invest in a money market, in a fixed income, in an equity fund, in a balanced fund, or, a, or even a real estate fund. So again, depending on your goals and objectives, there are multiple options. And I suggest that because of maybe where we are coming from economically, we don't have so much money. So people should explore that option. Um, on average, um, I mean, at Stanley, our money market funded around 16.85.
So imagine you have 100 CDs and enjoying 16.85. And I know Timo will not agree with me, but if you went to any bank and say they have 100 CDs to invest, they would have to be able to put it in a savings account. But with 100 CDs, you get to enjoy really great returns. And I'm, I'm sure it cuts across with the data banks, with the ADCs and all those things. So that's basically what I would recommend people look at. But again, let's be shaped by your goals and also your risk tolerance level. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Desmond. Um, I'm learning so much today. Um, it's important to understand your objectives and also understand the various products that are available. Um, Mabruk, the question I would ask is, um, how can one grow um, his or her investment or how do you grow the value of your investments? Okay. I mean, uh, I like what Desmond said. I mean, I like the fact that you spoke about the mutual fund. I mean, it's very, very important to speak about mutual funds, uh, being a collective scheme. Uh, it's one advantage that we all have. I mean, you will not get, I mean, certain returns on your funds for an amount of money, say, like 100 cents, as you rightly mentioned. You know, let me go directly to the question you asked. Um, how would you grow the value of your investment? There's no say something about compounding. And the answer is right there. It's in compounding. I mean, compounding, compounding, compounding. That's what makes you have more value on your investment. What is compounding? I mean, compound is all about, you know, any interest on the interest that your investment earns, right? And this makes you have an exponential growth. The investment is going to grow exponentially. So, I mean, I, 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 I mean, that's what was, when that's what I spoke about, he doing some math, I also did some quick math. And I mean, I was looking at, say, investing 10,000 CDs uh, per quarter for 10 years. I mean, you put 10,000 CDs down for every quarter for 10 years, that comes up to about four. 100,000 Ghana CDs. But if you have an, a rate, say 20% per annum, and you invest the same 10,000 CDs at that rate, compounded every quarter for 10 years, you're going to have about 1.2 million Ghana CDs. So it's in the power of compounding. I mean, there's so much power in compounding. Uh, having said that, the other things you may also want to look out for, uh, like uh, reduce cost. I mean, uh, sometimes when you want to buy a mutual funds, for instance, I mean, it comes certain fees. Uh, there are front load fees, back load fees, and certain charges. I mean, you, you want to look out for a mutual fund that has a very low cost because, I mean, these charges actually affect, you know, your rate of return because it will be taken out of it. So you want to consider, I mean, fees and charges when you are placing certain investment. Um, even with shares, I mean, you may have to pay, you know, certain um, advisory fees uh, to purchase and sell your shares. So you have to consider which option. I mean, where can you get... Uh, a service that, I mean, comes at a reduced cost or fee. And you also want to consider uh, rebalancing. Uh, when I say rebalancing, ideally when you're investing or when you have multiple financial goals, you actually allocate your funds in specific or in a specific way. I think Mr. Akako spoke about that earlier on, where you should dedicate a certain amount of money to this, to that, to this, to that, to that, to that, to that. I mean, sometimes we are, you know, excited by the growth of a particular investment we have and instead of uh, sticking to our initial fund or asset allocation we end up making one particular investment option heavily weighted and that also affects um, the growth and value of our investment so we have to always come back to rebalancing and sticking to our plan whereby we say 20 percent is into this 30 percent to that first percent we always have to come back and rebalance all the time uh, speaking about rebalancing allocation obviously uh, I mean, or draw attention to diversification. I mean, diversification is one way of, you know, securing our back and ensuring that the value of our investment is always kept, you know, uh, at a good level. Um, for instance, I mean, last year we all, you know, saw what happened in the, you know, the, the, the COVID era where certain stock prices dipped, went down the drain and so forth and so forth. If all your investments were held in such a security, you can imagine what happened to you. A lot of people who went on pension and all their funds were in certain uh, assets of that nature. So when COVID hits and the funds mm -hmm. drop, you know that what you are in trouble. But when you diversify, you probably have some in bonds, you have some in let's say uh, uh, money market instruments, and these instruments may provide you a, a, a reduced or let me say comparatively a lower return, but then the, the, the risk is very low as well. And by diversifying in such, you know, uh, a situation, you'll be sure that, I mean, even though your, 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 your equity investments fell down, your investments in the bonds or money market fixed deposits would be what? 
uh, stable. Uh, so diversification is one way, you know, to ensure that the value of our investment is kept, you know, at par. So I mean, I would say in order to ensure the value of your investment grows, first consider compounding, think long term, long term, don't think short term, don't try to get money overnight. I mean, you have to think long term, believe in the power of compounding. Look out for you know ways and means to reduce the cost of your transaction, as this has a direct inf uh, uh, implication to the net you know uh, interest which you receive. Consider diversification, and most importantly, to always rebalance your account. So that's what I have to say about uh, ways and means to ensure that the value of your investment uh, grows. Um, interesting. The um, diversification is very crucial. We should learn more about diversification, and then the the power of compounding. Uh, I think I read something that Warren Buffett said sometime that compounding is actually one of the wonders of the world. And I very much believe in that. Um, I'm very sorry that we have to um, go past the time that we originally stated that the, the plan was to end the session by 750, but I think we're having a good time. And then the insights that are coming in is very um, amazing. So kindly bear with us as we go past the, the time just a little bit. So, um, I mean, ho hopefully, we, we would finish soon. And then um, this is why we, sh we should all join the monthly webinars and then learn so much. So um, I'll go back to um, Mr. Emmanuel Kwada so that he shares with us some types of um, insurance products or the, the, yeah, the, the, the types of insurance products. We had a general overview of what insurance is. So we'd want to know what are the various types of insurance products. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the question. Um, in fact, there are, there are two broad types of uh, insurance products. There are two broad categories you can have is life insurance and then non-life insurance, or what we call the general business insurance. Um, when it comes to life insurance, um, life insurance, you can have the risk-related products. And when I say risk-related products in life insurance, we are basically talking about these products where in case death or case, uh, life insurance comes in to compensate uh, the affected individual, or perhaps it's not death, but it is disability, or it could be a situation of critical illnesses. So you suffer a critical illness, uh, the policy comes in to pay some benefits to you. If it is a, a case of disability, be it temporary disability or permanent disability, it helps you out. And like I have mentioned, uh, when there is a case of death, be it to yourself, or to other people who uh, you are taking care of, that also helps you to, to be able to give you some cushioning. Uh, when you move beyond the life insurances, but the, the other form of life insurance you can have are the investment linked products. Now the investment linked products can come in two forms. This is where the bankers on the platform and the uh, investment specialists on the platform who seem to disagree sometimes. But, uh, if you have a little bit of an understanding, you realize that it is also worth considering an investment product from the insurance side. Why am I saying so? If you pick an investment product, which is like an endowment product, for example, in insurance, and as an endowment product basically is saying that uh, work to an insurance company, tell them how much money you want and over what period of time you want to get that amount of money. And then they will tell you how much you should pay on a monthly basis to be able to get to that goal. So I can walk to Hollard, tell Hollard that I need 100,000 CDs in 10 years from now. Tell me how much I should pay on a monthly basis so that in 10 years from now, I walk to you and you give me 100,000 CDs. And Hollard will design that kind of a product for you. The advantage of that kind of a product when you come to insurance is that it assures you the 100,000 CDs, be it that you live or you die. So if you live to hit the 10 years, you go for 100,000 cities. If unfortunately you don't travel to hit the 10 years and you die, your beneficiaries get to get the 100,000 cities. If you compare this with an instrument from a pure investment house, where you are having 100,000 as a goal, and then maybe projections, they are telling you that maybe do 500 Ghana this monthly, you can be able to reach that 100,000. What can happen in that case is that, um, when you die along the way, for example, your beneficiaries will just go for how much total has accrued at the time of death, plus the investment returns that has added on. 
So that's where insurance is slightly different from what you get from the normal investment houses. Now, let me caution here. And before you throw one away, let me caution. If we put certain instruments, in fact, when I put money into insurance, and then the underlying instruments of investment are the same as, let's say I take money to uh, Stanley uh, or Stanbeck, and I invest in their Stanley product. And they also have the same underlying instruments for that kind of an investment. This is what is likely to happen. Because the insurance is guaranteeing the amount for you in case death or case, there is a component of your contributions that will be taken to take care of that guarantee that they are giving you. So breaking it down much further, if I give, say, 100 Ghana CDs, instead of investing the 100 Ghana CDs, an insurance company can invest 95 CDs because the five CDs is being used to provide the guarantee of the 100,000. If I give 100 Ghana CDs to, say, Stanbeck for their Stanley product, maybe little charges, administrative charges, so they will put in 99 CDs. So comparing the two, insurance is investing 95. Stanley is investing 99. We are all going to put them in the same underlying instruments. What you should know, therefore, is that if we go 10 years down the line, the Stambic instrument is likely to return more than the insurance instrument, just because the insurance instrument is making some deductions towards a protection to guarantee that in case therefore case, they will still give you the end amount. However, the Stanley instrument will not guarantee the end goal. All they are doing is that at any point in time that therefore case, they would give you what has accrued plus your investment returns. So that is where the difference lies. So each product is necessary. So if you are a parent for one and you have dependence on you and you want to invest towards their future education and you lose your life along the way, those dependents are still rest assured that there's money that their father has left behind that can take care of their future. As against the other form of investments where if unfortunately you don't travel far before you lose your life, uh, you are likely not to reap the full benefits for your beneficiaries. So we insurance people, we always look at uh, the, 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 the undesirable aspect, the one that people normally not look at, that I'm talking of issues of death here. When you talk of the investments in the insurance space, that is how they work. Sometimes too, we have instruments where uh, you also decide on a monthly amount of money to contribute. If you come to Olaf, for example, there is this product we call the Adepa Savings Plan. You just decide on the amount of money you want to contribute on a monthly basis, and you choose the duration you want to go. And then all the company does is to invest that money and then promise you some payout in case they're for case. But all the same, it's an investment product. So I've just explained to you how the insurance one is different from the normal investment uh, 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 homes that you will get. Now, traveling or moving away from a life insurance product, when you come to the general side, in my introductory commentary, I made mention of if you're a young person, you bought a car, you want to get it insured, you are building a house, you want to make sure that that is also taken care of. And interesting enough, health insurance, sometimes you get people who do uh, health insurance for individuals. If you get that opportunity, take advantage of it. In fact, the younger you are, the lesser your premium or the monthly contributions, or sometimes it's annual contributions. So if you are a young person, it is good to buy insurance because your contributions are, are lower, much lower. Uh, as you grow older, your risk becomes higher to the insurance company. So once the insurance company is considering you as a higher risk, they make you pay more premiums. So the good time to buy insurance is when you are young. Unfortunately so, uh, young people always think that insurance is not meant for them. It's meant for the older folks. And that is where we get it wrong. It's really, really cheap when you are young uh, and you are buying insurance than when you grow a little bit older. So uh, two forms of insurance. In fact, there are many, many things insurance can do. When you want to travel, insurance can step in for you because you can travel and lose your luggage. Uh, you can travel and fall sick and then you need medical care. And that is why when you are traveling, you need a travel insurance plan because those are the things it can take care of for you. There are cases where you can insure yourself for a personal accident. So in case you get yourself involved in any accident, uh, the insurance company compensates you with some money to take off the injuries and then the medical bills. And then sometimes if you have lost the body part, you are giving money to, to compensate you and to say sorry for 
uh, that which has occurred. In fact, there are several insurance policies that I can mention, but for time, I will not be able to go through all of them. The, the few that I'll mention that, that I would like to share is what I have shared now. But remember, if you are an income earner, and remember this, perhaps I will not get the opportunity to come in again. If you are an income earner, uh, look at this circle. You are the income earner. If you have a spouse and you have children and you have parents living and you have in-laws living, all these people, you are in the center. Anything that happens to anybody in this circle affects you. If anything happens to your spouse, it affects your income. It happens to your child, it affects your income. It happens to the parent, it affects your income. And that is why you should not consider uh, just other forms of, of, of investment and ignore it. All these lives around you, because they have a bearing on your income, you want to take the wisest decision of insuring all of them. So if something happens to them, you know that you don't you don't have to pull from your 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 investments to go and take care of the eventuality. Insurance will come in to support you. Worst case scenario, if it is you yourself who departs, then the money you are leaving behind through insurance, your children and your spouses are able to take that money, and then life is able to continue. So that is what I'll say uh, in that regard now. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Manuel Akwada. I actually enjoy um, the insights that you have shared. Insurance is cheap for young people. I think that's one of the things that I picked up. When you are, The best time to actually buy an insurance uh, policy is when you are young, because yeah. that's where the, the risk is low. Because when you go to a point, the risk gets high, so you pay more. So yeah. I think the best time that we can buy insurance for our parents is now when we are young, so that someday when the unfortunate happens, we don't find ourselves um, wanting. Um, we would do, do just a few questions and then we should be um, done for today. I think we've learned so much in the session today and um, we can go back and make informed financial decisions. So um, we'll not do the entire round, um, I'll just ask, some random questions, and then we can take it from there. So um, one question for Desmond. Um, how do you know an investment is worth it or not? How do you know an investment is worth it or not? So uh, thanks again. So how would you know whether an investment is worth it or not? If one, it doesn't meet, help you meet your, your goals. If you're just jumping in because you heard that, okay, for example, Bitcoin is going up, so let me just jump in. And you just go in maybe the following day, the price tips. If you invested all right, but that investment has not helped you achieve your goal. And another thing probably you also look at maybe generally is that if it is too good to be true, then it's probably not true. Always ask the right questions. And I think that will help you know whether what you're actually investing in is actually good. It, is, it, is it the best? Is it actually licensed? Some of the questions you might ask yourself or you might get some really interesting answers. So. Um, yeah, I think it's important that people people acknowledge this fact that if the investors won't help you achieve your goals, then it's probably not the best form of investment for you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Desmond. We started with um, objectives of investment. Emmanuel Akato shared a few things that we should take note of. Mabruk also mentioned about the objectives. And so what you should do is ask yourself that, is this investment helping you to meet that objectives or those goals? And if it's not, then it's not worth it. And another important thing you should also notice, if it is too good to be true, then you should um, be very skeptical and then ask the right questions. Um, Mabu, can you also share with us what your thoughts are? How do you know that an investment is worth it or not? Um, okay, so basically, um, every investor has an expected rate of return. I mean, something that he or she is looking out for. And uh, you determine this uh, through the goal she set and based on the goal she set, uh, the time horizon, how long it's gonna take you to get, you know, to meet this objective. I mean, you have an expected rate of return that you are looking out for. So when you go onto the market uh, and you find an investment, which interest rates, you know, kind of meets or exceeds your expected rate of return, then you can see uh, it's worth it. Uh, however, the issue of uh, what is worth it may, is, can be relative. I mean, to someone, it may not be worth it, to someone it will, but then the bottom line is once it meets or exceeds your rate of return, uh, special rate of return, then you can consider it to be uh, a worth it investment. Uh, even with, uh, with mutual funds, I mean, that's what they do. I mean, it's always take to a particular benchmark. Uh, once it exceeds that, I mean, 
they've achieved that. So such an investment will be uh, worth it for them. Um, it goes beyond just uh, expected rate of returns. I mean, there are some form of investment that you, you cannot determine you know, the rate of returns, like let's say stocks. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, how are you going to know the rate of returns in the future now? I mean, so you may want to look at certain factors. I mean, you want to consider uh, the performance of this company. You want to know um, how they are doing in the markets, how their sales are like, their market share. You want to consider stuff like their price per earning ratio, you know, compared to the average in the industry. When you compare to the average in the industry, then you may know that, okay, fine, this investment you're going to buy, uh, is it overpriced or underpriced? And uh, you can take certain insights from that. And then, I mean, based on that, you can know that, okay, fine, the investment that you just went into, I mean, was a good one or a bad one. I mean, also with bonds, you can consider, I mean, uh, uh, the yield to maturity as a rate and, you know, benchmark is to the expected rate of returns. And that could help you to, to determine whether uh, your, your decision was right or not. And bonds, you know, with bonds, I mean, the maturity days vary. Uh, you know, we spoke about the first category, you know, bonds, I mean, some can go for so many years. You want to look at stuff like when will this bond mature? And, and you also compare to your time horizon. Does it meet or not? If it doesn't, you know, okay, fine. Don't consider that. Look elsewhere. Uh, so all in all, I think um, expected rate of return is very important. Comparing them to benchmark is also very important. And looking at the performance, if it has to do with equity, is also very important. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mabrook. Um, thank you, everyone, especially to our panelists for joining in to this session, to sharing all these insights. I think we've learned a lot, and we can call it a good day. Um, this webinar um, is an initiative of African Observations. It's a, it's a an app, a mobile app that is being um, launched soon, and then it's supposed to help you to make better and informed financial decisions. So basically, you'll be getting financial insights um, via this app, and then um, you can also get to seek advice on the app. So once the app is 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 out there, it will be shared with you for joining in today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining in. And we will share the insights with you um, once we gather everything. And um, I would want to wish you all a special good night. Thank you so much. And then see you next month for our webinar. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you very much.